which is not even on the slide here, so great. Um, yeah, so the long version of the title is uh, Interprocedural Context Unbounded Analysis of Concurrent Programs. It's a little bit bulky, uh, but uh, of course, I'll explain what, what this is even about. So this is going to be an analysis uh, uh, paper, a little bit like the, the previous one. And the uh, target of the analysis here are um, concurrent threads that run um, possibly recursive procedures. So each thread has a stack attached to it where it records the, the currently executed stack frame. And these procedures are also communicating with each other using read, write, uh, shared variables, okay? Um, so here's an example of uh, one such program, which I don't want to go into uh, details, but we will use this example uh, in some future slides, okay? It's just, just two procedures, uh, each executed by a thread, and they do some concurrent stuff, okay? Um, more interestingly, so here's sort of a summary of this uh, programming model, which I sketched on the previous slide. So we have these concurrent threads, recursive procedures, shared variable communication. Uh, and uh, the execution model is uh, um, uh, strictly interleaving semantics, so there's no uh, synchronous execution steps. And uh, for this talk, we'll just assume that we don't have to deal with um, uh, data state explosion, so let's uh, have a finite variable domain, like Boolean domain, for instance, uh, in which case these things essentially boil down to concurrent pushdown systems, okay? And uh, so this is, in a sense, a, a talk about a very, very classical problem. Um, namely, it doesn't get much simpler than this. It's uh, the problem of uh, the reachability of certain violated uh, assertions. So an assertion for us is a statement over the uh, shared variables and the um, variables at the top of the stack frame, so the procedure local variables, everything that a, a thread can see. Uh, and uh, so these are um, properties defined over what's visible by one thread, but of course, whether they hold or not depends on the uh, global um, inter-thread behavior. And that makes the analysis complicated. Uh, so what would you do is you, you would do some kind of reachability analysis on the uh, global state space. Uh, and then you get these uh, traces that look like this. Um, and these traces, of course, are generally infinite uh, because the state space is infinite uh, because uh, these stacks can grow without bound, okay? These threads can keep pushing stuff onto the stack. Uh, and I'm gonna use this notation for global states in the, the rest of this talk quite frequently. So I basically show the shared state in the front of this vertical bar and then the, uh, the stacks for both uh, threads, okay? In this case, the stack number one actually doesn't have recursion, so the stack always has size one, uh, but the stack of size two keeps, keeps growing and then you have an unbounded reachability problem. Okay, so this is, as, as I said, extremely classical. What do we know about this uh, problem? So not only is the reachability set infinite, uh, reachability is in fact undecidable, uh, as was uh, discovered um, certainly in 2000 and maybe even before that. Uh, and uh, so there was this paper by uh, Ramalingam. I have slightly modified the title to better be in sync with this talk. Uh, but the essence is for us that interprocedural concurrent reachability analysis uh, is, is undecidable, uh, even for finite domain variables like in this case. Uh, and um, so here's a listing of what the exact conditions are that make the problem undecidable. Um, so the next question obviously, obviously is what can we do about this problem? And the, the previous talk gave, uh, gave a bit of a glimpse of that. Um, in practice, people will often apply various kinds of bounds uh, to analyses. Um, and uh, only a couple of years after this undecidability result, one such proposed bound was uh, to bound the number of uh, execution contexts, which means the number of times the right to execute can switch between one thread and another one, okay? So an execution context is basically a sequence of steps executed by one and the same thread without any preemption, without any switch of control. And uh, so it turns out, even though it's not totally trivial, that this uh, such a bound makes the uh, reachability problem decidable. I say it's not totally trivial because the, uh, the infinite state space problem, of course, remains. Uh, because even in the sequential case with just a single thread, I can pump arbitrarily many uh, frames onto that stack. So this is, uh, even for a single thread, an infinite state uh, problem. Um, but it turns out uh, for a bound on this uh, execution context number, uh, you can represent these infinitely many um, states using a, a data structure that was introduced even a little bit before that paper uh, called pushdown store automata, and that allows you to uh, compute the reachability set under that bound precisely. Uh, and uh, so that gave rise to uh, various implementations of bug finding techniques where you would increase that bound until you uh, discovered a bug or you ran out of resources or somehow you had the feeling that mm, this is probably uh, everything that's relevant for me and I have some confidence that there's nothing wrong with this uh, 
um, with this program. Uh, and the goal in this paper, of course, is to make this more rigorous, to lift that bound out of the analysis, turn it into a proof technique, and this is now where the Cuba thing comes from, okay? Uh, this will become a context unbounded analysis, okay? All right, uh, and uh, so how are we going to do that? Um, well, the, uh, the rough idea will be we want to um, detect some kind of convergence of these uh, sequences that we compute here. And uh, so let's look at this uh, sequence of reachable states. Um, one thing that works in our favor is the fact that this is a monotone sequence, which means if I increase the number of uh, context switches that I'm allowed to make, then of course I can only see more reachable states. This, uh, the sizes of these sets here, they, that can't go down. Um, there's a little more to that statement, but um, um, I'll, I'll not go into this now. Uh, what does not help us is the fact that uh, this, uh, these sets, they grow without bounds. So they're infinite sets, okay? So I, it seems like strange, how would they, how would they converge? Um, and so the answer is we need to uh, modify this, 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 these sets that we're tracking a little bit. We need to make a little bit more modest observations about our programs or less precise observations. So let's say instead of these uh, full reachability sets that I had here on this previous slide, which grow without bound, we instead uh, track only reachable combinations of uh, basically the top slice of the stack. So more precisely, uh, combinations of the shared state and the top stack frame. Um, that seems reasonable, first of all, because all the uh, properties that we're interested in, these assertions, they are expressible over these, uh, over these top stack frames, stack frames, okay? My properties don't look deep into the stack and say what happened three recursion rounds before. They don't say that. Um, uh, but more interestingly, uh, in this case, since we're assuming here a finite number of local uh, states, uh, the sequence is now this sequence here, okay, where we track these T's as opposed to these R's. The sequence is now over a finite domain, okay, because we have finitely many shared states, finitely many top stack frames. Um, so that sequence has a finite domain. Uh, it is, of course, still monotone as the previous sequence. And if you have a monotone sequence over a finite domain, what's going to happen? This thing is going to converge always, period. Okay? Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, these X's here just say that because we're now being less precise, we track only the top stack frame information, uh, there will be uh, repeats. Okay? Uh, so these states here, for instance, compared to the previous picture, um, this one. Uh, they only distinguish in the part of the state space that I'm not tracking, which is the, the bottom of the stack, basically. Okay, so this is then roughly the plan. Um, at this point, you might wonder, so, but didn't this guy just tell us that this problem is undecidable, okay? And now he is showing us this uh, sequence that's guaranteed to converge to the exact reachability set. Uh, how, how is this possible? Um, well, that's exactly where the, the crux here lies. So I'm only claiming that um, the sequence always converges. I'm not saying that you can always easily tell that it has converged for any particular value of k. Uh, and if you think about this uh, for a second, you will easily come uh, to the uh, realization why this is the case. So um, here again is the, uh, this reachability, um, this, this trace that I showed at the beginning, and this time projected to these top configurations. And I have again marked all these uh, repeated states, okay, which you would drop um, if you're interested in just computing the reachable states. And if I now do that, if I now align these, uh, these repeated states, then we see that our sequence has these ugly holes, okay? So for instance, here for k equals three, for a bound of three, um, there's no new top stack frame that I've never seen before. Um, but for k equals four, uh, there's a new top stack frame that shows up and that could, for instance, violate an assertion, okay? Uh, so again, the reason is we're only tracking partial information about the state, what's going uh, on underneath the hood we ignore it here, and uh, that is what causes this uh, particular stage here to present itself as a whole in that sequence, okay? Actually, what we, uh, we call this a, a stuttering point of the sequence, okay? Uh, so if you think about this uh, sequence as a kind of as a function over the values of k, then you get a picture like this, right? Where the sequence is monotone, uh, but it's not strictly monotone, okay? It has these uh, funny uh, plateaus here uh, that uh, we need to distinguish from the actual point of convergence. And so that basically is why this problem, of course, remains undecidable. Um, these will make it impossible for us to easily detect convergence. Uh, but I'll tell you uh, how, we, how we deal with this problem. Uh, so before that, let me just give you the, the, the sort of the big uh, picture here of our context unbounded analysis. It's, it's very simple. It's basically an infinite loop over these uh, context bounds, K, 
So we keep increasing them. And for each k, we compute first the exact reachable state set, okay, which is computable. Uh, check that for bugs, of course, on the way. And if we don't find any bugs, then we project that set to this top projection, to this top slice, okay, to this slice that is only over a finite, uh, the, uh, finite domain. Uh, and if we have, uh, at this particular stage, k reached the same result as in the previous um, round, okay, for k minus 1, and we can somehow decide that this is not a fake um, situation here that kind of claims or looks like it's converging, but it's actually only stuttering. If we can decide that that's not the case, then um, this infinite loop here will be broken, and we will say we, will say we have reached a point of convergence. This program uh, doesn't have any errors. Okay? Otherwise, we keep going. Um, so this modulo, me telling you how we do this stuttering detection, this uh, can, in principle, detect um, bugs and can also prove correctness. Uh, but because the problem is undecidable, what will happen in non-trivially many cases in practice is that uh, this will keep going forever. So my stuttering um, detection here, of course, is imprecise, and it will not always tell me the truth. Um, okay, so let me tell you about this um, stuttering. How do we uh, distinguish that from actual convergence? So here's again uh, this uh, sequence that we had earlier with this one stuttering state. And uh, we call this uh, states that show up for the first time after a point of stagnation or stuttering. We call these generator states um, because these are, in some sense, the first states that give rise to potentially more uh, never seen before uh, states, but they are kind of the first, right? So there's something, uh, there's a break here in that sequence, and now we have this generator state which might give rise to, to more states. Um, and uh, so perhaps you have a feeling at this point that there must be something weird with these states. There must be something special about them. And that's exactly the key to, to detecting them. So let's look at the statement that gave rise to this uh, state here. This state was uh, generated by, um, or uh, came about as the result of a, a pop transition, uh, where from this state here, we popped this top uh, level symbol four in thread two, and then this uh, symbol six at the second position moved to the top of the stack. And uh, if you think about this for a little bit, you will realize that this is not a coincidence. So the pop transitions are the only ones that actually depend on the history of the stack. Um, unlike pushes or simple local state changes, okay, where uh, no function call in any way is involved. Um, so for pushes and local transitions, this cannot happen. You can never see one of these states uh, after the sequence uh, stutters caused by a push or a local state transition. That can only happen if you sort of dig deep into the stack um, and uh, you have a statement that actually depends on the history. And the only other information we have about this uh, funny generator state is that there's this local state six here, which must have been pushed at some point earlier onto the stack, okay? This guy can't come from nowhere. It has to have been pushed at some point. Okay, and this kind of gives us uh, the idea for um, for cracking this problem. So the idea will be that uh, we try to identify statically what these generator states are. And if we can decide that as we do our reachability analysis incrementally, uh, at any point we have reached all these generators that can possibly be reached, that will be our signal that the sequence has converged. Okay, so how do we define this generator set statically? So this will be obviously an uh, approximation. We have to make it as, as precise as we can. And we will say that um, the set of generators is this set of top um, stack configurations such that there exists a uh, thread in the program that has a pop edge that leads to the shared state. Okay, um, And uh, then, as I uh, mentioned on the previous slide, there must also be a push edge in the program of this thread that pushes this uh, symbol sigma i, which is now at the top of the stack. So this must have been pushed at some point during execution. Statically, what that means is there must be a push edge in the program. That's the best we can say. Okay, and then so the theorem is going to be if we are at one of these points of uh, stuttering in the sequence and the reachable fragment of these generator states here is all contained in my current reachable set, TK. Okay, so this, this union here is the full set of reachable um, top configurations. If this is the case, then my sequence has converged. Okay? All right, so this is a completely dumb theorem. And it's completely useless the way it's written on the board. Uh, and the reason is that it uses precisely the information that I'm trying to compute, which is the set of reachable um, top configurations, this reachable set here. Okay? I'm trying to project this statically defined set G to its reachable fragment by intersecting it, it with this set that we're trying to compute. 
So that's nonsense, that can't work. Um, but uh, the answer is uh, quite simple. Uh, it's true, we want to compute this set precisely. Um, but uh, for this test here, for uh, testing whether we have seen all um, uh, reachable generator sets, we actually don't need this precise set. We can work with approximations. And that's the last technical point I have to make. Um, so it's a very simple point. So suppose that we, again, tightly, if possible, over approximate this uh, reachability set by some set Z, and then we plug, we change the theorem slightly by um, uh, switching, uh, uh, by, by replacing this union, which we don't know, by this over approximation, then of course the theorem still holds because we have only made the preconditions of this theorem stronger, okay? Um, and so that's then the, the basis of our solution. So we statically pre-compute these sets G and then some kind of over approximation of these reachable sets. Um, and uh, when this intersection G intersects Z is completely contained in one of these reachable sets for a given K, then the sequence definitely converges at that particular point. Okay, and how do we compute such an over approximation? There's many ways of doing that. That's uh, quite simple. Um, one very simple one is to say, well, we can just cut off the stack at some fixed bound, um, like here at bound two maybe. Uh, whenever we try to push something beyond that stack size, we ignore it, we just drop it to the floor. Uh, but when we have a pop operation uh, on a currently full stack, then this is where we have to pay for this. We don't know what the, um, the, uh, what the next um, symbol in the stack is that moves up because we haven't recorded that information. And that's where we have to invest non-determinism to resolve this. Okay, so we say the next element that's going to move here to the bottom of the stack from this unknown or untracked piece of uh, memory uh, that, is, uh, that has to be a symbol that was at some point pushed by the program under the, uh, the, the top of the stack, okay? So there has to be a push operation in this program that modifies the, second, the next symbol to the symbol sigma. So the symbol sigma here, um, right under the top of the stack, is uh, like, um, uh, as it says on the slide, a con continuation point after, after a return, okay? This is where control returns after you come back from a recursive call. And any of these symbols are candidates for the new uh, bottom of the stack, so we, we pick them non-deterministically. Okay, and due to this uh, bound here, you now have a finite state, um, finite state space. You can compute this, uh, this particular, you can solve this particular uh, problem precisely, and we use this as the approximation of our uh, reachable top frames. Plug this in the theorem on the previous slide here, and, um, and that's basically the algorithm. Okay, so here, real quick, an example. Uh, in this program that I showed you at the beginning, um, there's exactly one pop rule and one push rule. And it turns out that our statically defined set G consists exactly of four states. And uh, two of those you can quickly rule out uh, using purely static analysis techniques as unreachable. And then you end up with this approximation, over approximation of your reachable generators. Okay, so these are the two states that we have to look out for. Uh, and now I do my uh, iterative um, analysis. At my first point of stuttering at this point here, I check whether I have already seen both of these states. And that's not the case, okay? I've seen this guy, okay, that was reached here very early. But this one here, I haven't seen yet. So at this point, I can't tell whether this state will ever be reachable in the future. Um, so that means I have to keep going. Uh, and uh, conveniently, in the next uh, step, this uh, state shows up. So now I know that I'm kind of done, except that I still have to keep going until I reach the next uh, of these stuttering steps, okay? This is exactly the generator effect. So this new guy can now generate a few more states that I've never seen before. But when my uh, sequence plateaus again, then I know that I'm, I'm done, okay? And then um, this, uh, in this case, the set T6 or T5, actually, T5 and T6 are the same, obviously. This is the exact set of top uh, stack configurations. And if I haven't found a bug up to this point, then my um, program is safe. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, some experiments we did with this. So in the paper, we only uh, report uh, uh, about experiments with um, essentially concurrent pushdown systems. So how this is implemented on large programs is something I have to take offline. Um, so here we have a uh, um, few examples from, uh, from the paper of like moderately sized uh, programs. Most of them save because the goal is to generate all reachable states. Um, the only thing I wanna point out really here is that these bounds for which uh, either an error was detected or more interestingly, the uh, reachability sets converged, they're relatively small, okay? So like three, four, five, six in that order. So that means you can actually 
uh, compute these things. Uh, and if we compare with uh, other tools that are um, by necessity context bounded, for instance, the uh, JMOPED tool, which is uh, an analyzer for concurrent Java programs, Boolean Java programs. Um, so what we did here is we first used our tool to compute this uh, convergence bound K. Uh, and then we took that fixed K and ran uh, one of the bounded tools, such as JMOPED, on that fixed bound, on that bound K. Uh, then you see here that the uh, uh, time consumption is sort of comparable. Maybe uh, Cuba is a little bit better, but it's not hugely different because that's not the point. The point is that in about the same time, using our analysis, you get a, a proof of correctness, okay? Not just a, an under approximation or in sort of an uncertain outcome of the analysis, uh, whereas that's what you get with uh, bounded tools um, that have existed in the past. Okay, uh, so in the paper, there's one uh, aspect that I don't have time to talk about here, but it's kind of uh, interesting, so I wanna point it out. Uh, you might have uh, wondered why we compute the uh, reachable, full reachable states first and then project them down to this uh, uh, bounded set of top projections. So there's lots of uh, questions related to this particular step. Um, one is that this reachable set here can be infinite, whereas this one is always, always finite. So there's this huge blow up in the middle in some sense. Uh, that has interesting consequences. And it's clear that the question uh, whether this RK set for a given K is finite should be a very relevant question because if it is infinite, it can be, uh, if it is infinite, then we have to use uh, symbolic techniques such as these push down store automata to even compute this set. Uh, and they are much more bulky. They're much more difficult to, to handle. So we would like to know uh, whether in a particular case, this set is finite. And that turns out uh, kind of a non-trivial question. Uh, and we discussed that in the paper. It actually is a pretty big part of the paper. Uh, and so final slide. Uh, what I've shown you here is uh, an instance of uh, checking convergence of a sequence of certain observations uh, about the program. These these, the sequence is motivated by um, increasing uh, resource bounds. The resource in this case was the uh, um, number of context switches that the program is allowed to make. That's, of course, a very general paradigm. I've shown you here this uh, Cuba instance. We've also applied this to distributed message passing programs uh, where the uh, resource is the size of a FIFO queue. Uh, and we're planning to apply this to many more instances because again, it's, it's, it seems like so uh, general. Okay, so the tool is uh, available on our website uh, with lots of other resources. I'd like to point out uh, Peso Liu here, who is uh, the student that uh, I did this work with. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. Questions? Thanks for the interesting talk, Thomas. The Z set that was over, over approximating the set that would otherwise be difficult to compute. What you did, as I understood, was you, you made the over approximation that a pop can give you something that you've seen before on the stack, but it may not be something that would be the exact previous thing on the stack. That is correct. Does that mean there's a kind of infinite set of more precise approximations you could do where you track a bit about the, a finite amount of history and you could be more, a little bit more precise or even more precise or even more precise and Yes. Is that something you consider? So in principle, yes. Although the way I presented this here is we compute this completely statically, okay? To compute the set Z, we don't really do any reachable, reachability analysis on the actual program, only on the simplified program. But uh, yes, you can modify this whole setup and uh, perform it in a more dynamic way. And then, yes, you're right. Then you can get uh, a lot more precision out of, out of this analysis. And for instance, precision uh, for the set Z, that, that's true. Um, in fact, when you implement this for larger programs, you would not quite do it uh, the way I presented it here today. Um, but that's, that's totally correct. Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, what, what, uh, what's your model of threads here? Is, is it sort of uh, like parallel composition or more fork join? So, I mean, it's, it's just interleaving, uh, interleaving semantics. Um, basically, this is a technique that was developed for, for pushdown systems, okay? So what programming language constructs these threads come from is kind of orthogonal to this, um, okay. to this work. The only thing is that it's strictly interleaving semantics. Does that, does that help? Uh, sure, yeah, thank you. Okay. I have another question about your treatment of the stack, also related to the abstraction and, and precision there. So another thing you can do is to take your cue from uh, nested word automata as opposed to pushdown systems mm -hmm. and 
peek back at the call site to look at the stacks that have arisen at the call site. That gives you a more precise uh, way of, of handling returns. That can be incorporated in pushdown systems with merge functions. Uh, yes. Which, which so, um, yes, when you implement this, te te this technique for real programs and not just pushdown systems, there's lots of more information you can extract from the program. And this, this is one of them, exactly. But, but is that something you do? I um, we or do it, although not for these, we haven't done it for these uh, stack programs. We've done it for these distributed programs with, uh, with your former student, Akash Lal, actually. I can tell you more about that. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that we do in the real world case. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.